welcome everyone. Welcome to the Wisdom in Times of Crisis online event where we get together for a week to explore what are the challenges and opportunities that this unique time offer us and what is the teachings, what is the wisdom that this time um, gives us to, to pause and reflect. Um, my name is Zaya Benazzo, and I'm delighted to have today with us H.A. Almas, Hamid Ali. Welcome, Hamid. Thank you so much for being with us today and offering your support and your time and your wisdom. Well, my pleasure to be with you again, Zaya. Thank you. I'm happy and to be here. Very happy to see you again. And uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce you for those of the uh, viewers that might not know who you are. I'm sure most people know, but H uh, Hamid Ali, H.A. Omas, is author and a spiritual teacher, and he's the founder of Diamond Approach. And Diamond Approach is a unique spiritual teaching which uses inquiry at its main, as a main practice and um, Diamond Approach, approach um, sees freedom as a living realization. And um, the practice is not about transcending our individuality, but embodying our transcended non-dual essence into our everyday life. And also, uh, according to Hamid, uh, according to your teaching, Omas, um, realization is a dynamic process that is never ending and keeps unfolding and keeps uh, revealing to us more and more uh, in time and in space. Um, so welcome and I just wanted to start with our first question that we're asking everyone uh, who is participating on the summit and mm -hmm. What do you see about this time? Like, what do you see that this crisis, if you see it as a crisis, is offering us to see more about who we are, about ourselves, and about reality? It's definitely a crisis. It is actually a sad situation that many are suffering. You know, many are sick, many are dying, many are losing loved ones, many are losing the jobs, many are alone and lonely with the social distancing. So there is more suffering around the globe than usual. There's always suffering. Human be, be, beings suffer, but this is more. You know, and um, so it is a crisis. And... Uh, it's not a crisis, it's not an existential crisis, but it is difficult times and challenging times for many, many people around the globe. I mean, and the interesting thing about it is the first time ever that it's a crisis that everybody's involved in. Exactly. There's no country, no nation, no people who are exempt everybody that's sort of what's new in it and that part can bring in an opportunity which is the fact of recognizing we're we're all connected we cannot separate ourselves there's no way to separate one nation from another one race from another we're all the same i mean <laughs> interesting the virus is equalizing us instead of pure awareness <laughs> <laughs> pure awareness that many people know equalizes everybody but very few people know about pure awareness and impacted by it <laughs> but the virus getting around <laughs> absolutely yeah. so it is in some sense a time uh, as you said to reflect because many to reflect partly because of difficulty and partly many people are home by themselves. They have more time. What do they do with themselves? They are with themselves. So many people are with themselves and they are experiencing difficulties, you know, in terms of some loved ones or the job. So 
usually that presents a, an opportunity you know that some people can utilize and some people won't some people will just buckle under you know feel hopeless and helpless it's usual uh, time difficult challenges some people don't can't handle it well and their, their worst self comes out but some people rise to the occasion and can rise to the occasion and use it for both to possibility to know themselves in a deeper way and uh, same time to contribute to make a difference you know for their better self to come out and and uh, help or be of assistance be do some service that helps the community at large and the one thing i was thinking because uh, title here is wisdom We're talking about wisdom now for me wisdom doesn't mean spiritual knowledge mm -hmm. wisdom doesn't mean words of wisdom wisdom means spiritual experience that is being expressed in one's action and living yeah. a wise person as a person who knows how to live in the world and behave and act according to the knowledge that they actually you know, embody or knowledge that they have realized. So wisdom is another step after realization, you see, after awakening. So not our, every awakened person is wise. They're wise in the sense they know, and they could speak wisely, but to live that wisdom is another thing. That, so in the Western tradition, Mm -hmm. Wisdom is Embodied. has to do with living. Yeah, embodying, living the realizations. Is dynamic. Yeah. Is not a. Is not yeah. knowledge. Wisdom is not knowledge. Yeah, yeah. In the in the Eastern tradition, frequently they talk about wisdom as of like Buddhists say, wisdom means knowledge of emptiness. Mm -hmm. That's not the meaning of wisdom in English, actually, <laughs> because in, in, in the Western tradition, is considered, for instance, like. King Solomon was considered wise. Why? Not, but his, what is what he was, what he did, what he was able to do, recover wisely. So that's an important thing for everybody to know. And and it is this time it actually that brings forth that. This time, you know, it is is an opportunity for us to learn about ourselves. And in a deeper, and for some of us, might be the first time we look at ourselves because uh, we're alone. There are all these difficulty, what's left? You. <laughs> so some people might occur to them, look inside and stuff. Just watch Netflix all the time, you know. So that can happen. You know, some people think, well, the whole human race is going to be transformed. I don't think so. Most of the human race are not that smart. Or, or that mature to use the occasion. So I think generally human race will change some, will move a notch or two, you know, but um, it's not like human race will be awakened and become wise. But there will be people, uh, hopefully by the time it's over, we'll have some more people who have deepened in now. I think the people who are on a spiritual path are the most likely to utilize the situation and to deepen their practice and their experience and to put it to practice, to really to express it. Like if they have compassion or they have awareness or they have an inner courage, how does that appear in this world in this situation and some people might be able to even awaken 
Well, I'm curious to see after two years how many people have awakened <laughs> out of this. They begin to awaken, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, awakening is a big deal thing. You know, many teachers that say, well, it's time for awakening. I say, what are you talking about? Most people, are, they just it's be good for them just to connect to the depth, to feel some compassion, love, some inner security, fearlessness, stuff like that. Awakening is a big jump. And do you make a distinction between awakening and realization, or you use them interchangeably? You know, realization is the establishing of awakening. Awakening, you awaken to what you are. Realization means has become established. You are that. You know, you know it doesn't go away. Is the maturity? That's, that's, that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. So that means establishment. It's stability stability in the awakened condition which is not an easy thing it's a second step the third step is the living it the wisdom of how to express it and how it comes through one's body and mind and heart into the world and communication with the world and people in it and i think uh, at the present time there are opportunity for all of those you know and but the for the people who are already have some understanding some spiritual uh, activation or spiritual access or spiritual nomination one level or another it's time for them to put it to practice to really you know both for themselves not to get depressed or hopeless to use their to, to connect with themselves deeper and recognize they are indestructible and they are really, they are not physical, that, they are, that the spirit is, cannot be uh, affected by anything, including viruses. And um, another thing is how to really bring it out into the world, how, how we interact, how we, what we do. How do we contribute in this way? Many people are coming out contributing, we know, to Susaya. Many people are doing a lot of good. I mean, doctors, nurses, even some of the governors are really putting their, their career on the line by trying to do what is best. So many people, those people, I think they're wise. They have some wisdom. They might not know where the wisdom is coming from. They don't have the inner experience, those people. They don't know it. You see, but for people who have spiritual orientation, it's obvious when they are uh, being compassionate, they feel the compassion, they feel it as a presence, as a, as a consciousness. When they are being courageous or fearless, they feel the state of fearlessness and courage, and they feel the strength and power in it. You know, so. But but many are expressing it, you know. So people say the, the best of human spirits coming out, and I think it is coming out in many places. But what is the human spirit? Yeah, you know, it, it is it is expressing itself. Many usually times of crisis or challenge, it does come out sometime for some people, and it's good to see that happening. And that humanity still have some of that in them, even though it's hidden. <laughs> it comes out at those times. But, uh, yeah. but some of us might be aware of it and um, can see how, we'll, how we, if we have kindness and compassion. What does that mean? I think part of kindness and compassion for us is, as I am, is to really follow the regulation, follow the um the guidelines to keep social distancing because we do it not just for ourselves but for others exactly. you see and it is so keeping i keep social distance not because i just don't want to be don't want to die but i don't want others to get sick exactly. and i know many people are doing it that way and, and uh, Governors are saying you want to do it that way, 
but it is a, it's an interesting time where yeah. it is a spiritual principle actually As every what is good for you is good for everybody what's good for everybody is good for you that happens in the spiritual realm usually but it's happening physically now with every time. movement we have to consider others as well that's yes. very beautiful exactly yeah we have to consider yeah. others but to do really do that it is an expression of love and caring and compassion and and yeah. recognition of the preciousness of other people. Mm. Um, and some people don't do it. Some people don't follow exactly the, because they don't have the inner. Yeah, and I feel that. very sad actually to observe that within yeah. the spiritual community, there has been actually a little bit of um, tensions and separation because a lot of people yes. don't believe in the virus or they believe in uh, conspiracy theories and actually it, it's been very sad to observe that um and yeah and well i mean yeah for for a while some people believed in conspiracy uh, uh, that it is not real there was denial and there was denial believing... yeah, maybe it's a human way to oh, be here when we i think partly people just deny they, they don't want to believe it's true yeah. just the various governments including the world health organization didn't really want to believe it's really going to be that bad you know people blaming oh you didn't tell us i think they were in denial it's as simple as that it's the it's same thing as the government. they don't want to believe it's that bad yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now but they can't deny it now it's, it's obvious no. And what's fascinating, and I wonder what you, to observe how this pandemic has really stopped the world, has made us pause, like globally, and nothing else like meditations and spiritual practices and activism calls for reducing CO2 emission. Nothing changed human behavior as much as this virus. Do you think at the bottom of that is fear of death? What do you think? Why this pandemic had such a power, in a way, to to put global world life on hold? Yeah, it's like being invaded by alien invaders. The whole world has to stop, stop, and take stock of the situation. Well, I think fear of death is definitely a big part of it because uh, it is possible that one can die. You know, and you don't have to be old to, to die. We find out more and more. The more we find out about it, the more we know it, it is dangerous. So it is a fear of death. I think that's part of it because it's instinctual, the f fear of death or the desire to survive is, a, is a, a, an organic biological response to danger. So it is the most powerful force, actually, the human, most human being experience, which is the instinct to, to survive. So that's come into operation, I think. I mean, so, so much so that people were, were, you know, agreed to do it, although they were losing their jobs and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, accepting isolation and not contact with people. So I think, yes, that's a big part of it. I don't think that's the only thing. You know, there are people who are doing it because they have what I call true conscience, which is a conscience that arises from a spiritual uh, illumination, a spiritual connection, which is the conscience that is dictated by the true uh, qualities of our spiritual nature it's love it's compassion it's intelligence it's uh, caring that appears it's, a, it's not like fear it's not my mind telling me i have to be good no i'm being good naturally spontaneously mm -hmm. and i'm generous and caring naturally spontaneously and the interesting thing about the spiritual conscience is not consciousness conscience uh, is that uh, 
it both has the caring and uh, the love and wanting to do what is best, but has in it discipline. That's one thing many people don't know about the spiritual conscience because not everybody who knows about spiritual experiences spiritual conscience. Spiritual conscience is a specific way of experiencing the spiritual nature, which is when we experience it, we feel grounded, realistic, down to earth. We know our capacities, we know our limitations, and we do what is needed. We have the capacity to discipline ourselves and uh, because a lot of the social distance requires a lot of discipline. Mm-hmm. You see, we have, to di- we have to discipline ourselves, not to go do what impulse happens. I need to be aware of it and keep it in check and stay away from, you know, infecting other people or getting infected. So the discipline is an important part of, of usually, you know, for most people, their conscience comes what we call super ego, their, their inner kind of historical, keep them good, keep them checked, you know, they call it conscience and make them feel guilty and stuff. This is not out of guilt. This is natural, spontaneous. So that is part of the wisdom that can come through. And would you say this is spontaneous or we cultivated through our spiritual practices, this kind of discipline to embody our deepest realizations? So many spiritual practices require a discipline. Like if you meditate every day and all that, you require a discipline. However, that's not the same thing as discipline on life, discipline in action. It is not a cultivation. It is a matter of discovering a certain way we can experience our spiritual nature. Mm. Because spiritual nature has many manifestations. One of the manifestations is the true conscience. When I experience the true conscience, I feel like uh, an immensity. It's like I feel I am in the middle of a big cathedral, mm. you know, like huge, like uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, something like that. Immense walls and true gra- reality, groundedness. So there's a sense of, because uh, the immensity is a protection. It's a protection of the truth, protection of reality, protection of the view of reality. And that brings in some kind of will. A true will and uh, that make it possible for us to be disciplined and the discipline then appears uh, effortlessly you see it's not like I have to really be strong and fight no the discipline flows out naturally we are naturally disciplined in terms of what we do uh, my social this in this case we have a particular situation which is social distancing how you know we relate to each other if we, are, if we are in the grocery store how we do it you know they're, they're actual practical thing and how to be disciplined in a way to protect ourselves and protect others so that discipline requires awareness as you can tell awareness and it, it exp- expresses the goodness of our spiritual nature but in a that part of the wisdom. To have, you cannot be wise in the world if you don't have true conscience. Mm-hmm. Part of expression in the world is, is uh, true conscience, which is living from conscience. You know, your chief talk about that, about conscience, that many people don't have conscience. Mm-hmm. And you have to develop what you call objective conscience. That's what he called it, objective conscience. Yeah. Easy. I'm and calling it true conscience, you know, but it's the same thing. So if I must, once we, that is developed, then it's expressed in every moment of our everyday life. That true consciousness kind of infuses our daily uh, actions or even when we're in yeah. the grocery store, they could be the sense of immensity or... Yes. Is, that's what you're pointing to. Yeah, it could be. It, it has immensity, but also has, it can 
express itself as a delicacy and, and mm. you remind and me at the same yeah. time um we had a conversation with matthew fox last weekend and he yeah. was talking about wisdom a sublime terrifying beauty uh, yeah julian of norwich has described and she lived during the plague as well in you know uh, mm -hmm. Century. Yeah. So, uh, so from my perspective, if we can express that in the world, how does that appear? Yes. Yes. We have, can have it as experience. I mean, spiritual experience is beauty in general, and some of it is more beautiful than others. I mean, part of why people like non dual, <laughs> because everything is beautiful, the whole world is beautiful. But uh, how do you live your life then? You know, so here it's a challenge for, in fact for for people who are on a spiritual path it's a good challenge to live their realization because we have a, a situation we we really need to be true we have to you know come to terms and we have to rise to the occasion mm. and, and not just stay home and just meditate i mean we can do that we can meditate but we still have to live yeah and what i mean in your work there is um i know in your teachings a lot of you, your students spend many years doing psychodynamic work unpacking early conditioning and patterns yeah uh, what do you say uh, what is the relationship between those early conditionings and our ability to express our realizations in our everyday life um yeah you cannot really express your one's realization in everyday life if we don't work through our conditioning yeah. but yeah. I, I mean we can but it will come out crooked yes it will come out sometimes at least with inappropriate behavior or incorrect behavior or incomplete behavior because that's what's in the way if that if it wasn't for that it would be easy for realization to express itself in the world but yeah. be, because what happens for most people there will be in a, in a some kind of sublime place or a non-dual place they they get out of the house they start behaving they come back they become their ordinary self all self you see they can't be that sublime place in, while they're walking and talking and shopping and interacting and all of that. And that is a big step for every every path. I mean, that's known for all the paths. That's the next step. Uh, uh, some people call it actualization, like then called it actualization. And um, and it is it takes longer than realization or awakening most bad know that because because it ha you have to work through everything you have to work out all the delusion illusion beliefs conditioning there's a lot you know and that takes it's an ongoing process and would you say that we ever um outgrow those conditionings or we just become more intimate with them and no, no, you outgrow your conditioning. Not outgrow, they won't be there anymore. Mm -hmm. They dissolve. If you no. understand them and if you really become aware of them, recognize them and know what they're about, where they come from, and you realize they're not true about you, they're true about somebody you were in the past, they naturally dissolve. Truth dissolves them and they won't be there. You know, I'm, I'm like many of the patterns, and, you know, and habitual way of doing the things that I used to have in the past, I, they just don't care. I don't have to deal with them. It's not like I'm aware of them and don't act. Mm -hmm. No, they're not there. They don't arise anymore. They, they don't arise, you know. Okay. But it, 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 takes, it takes a long time. It takes a long time because there's lots of them, layers upon layers upon layers of things, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I and I think most spiritual teaching, they know that. They know that uh, the true uh, 
realization, mature, it's called maturation realization. Uh, so that it becomes lived, takes time. No, it was actually, I don't know if I mentioned that to you, it was Dogen, one talks about some, who's the founder of the Soto <laughs> Zen. He's one of the greatest enlightened people in history. When a friend of his asked him in his old age, well, my friend, how's your realization? He said, well, my realization, well, thank you. However, my body is still having difficulty going along with it. <laughs> so that's, you know, that tells you, I mean, yeah. yes, you, you can experience it. Does your body go with it? Is it expressed through the body? Is the body completely become transparent, completely has no tensions, no blockages against any of the kind of wisdom and awareness and luminosity? So it comes through, you see. And that's why you call this never-ending process, right, dynamic? Yeah, it takes a long time. I want, the conditioning has an end. You can, you can finish with the condition. It takes a long time and we can be finished with it and live freely. We don't have to think about, you know, behaving uh, spontaneously, it just happens. And, and, and it is not just f free and it is just right. It is what is needed exactly, no more, no less. It's economic, it's intelligent, precise. That's part of the, you know, the wisdom is you know, that the right action kind of what yes that's yes, something that's called right action yeah. it will be right action but right action become natural action here yeah you're not thinking about the right action it's just your action and however that doesn't end the journey when you mentioned before realization continues that is not because of con because of conditioning what stops what makes we can finish with the conditioning and will be realized or awakened. However, there are other possible realization that ha haven't happened. That's not because of conditioning, but because of uh, views of reality, concept about what is real, what is possible. We don't know what's possible, what's not possible, you see. The fact that we don't know about the possibility of experiencing something, mm -hmm. we, that not knowing can become, we, we can take it as a position that that's not possible. You see? We you don't see. know it's possible to become a barrier to the new thing to appear. Uh -huh. So that becomes, I mean, Dogen called it delusion, and he said, delusion doesn't end with enlightenment. Enlightenment has delusion. Mm -hmm. Meaning, even when you're enlightened, there's still concepts and ideas about reality that not because you are conditioned, because it's sort of natural to assume because the state of real, each state of realization has its view of reality, right? If you take non-dual realization, the view is all pure awareness and consciousness and it, everything in the manifestation of that awareness and consciousness, and all of that. That is a view, however, and the person can become a mental view or at least an attitude. But there are realizations that have nothing to do with that. That's right. yeah. There are realizations that don't have anything to do whether uh, everything is a manifestation of consciousness. There are realizations, like even Zen has a realization called suchness. What they mean is everything as it is. They don't say it's consciousness. No, everything is as it is, pure as it is. Yeah. You see, that's a different kind of realization. If we have to believe everything is an expression of consciousness, we want to be able to experience that suchness. And then in suchness, there is no place of knowing necessary. You don't need to... No, you just know that everything is being itself. Yeah. Like I know uh, you Zaya, you know, and suchness. Zaya is Zaya. And Zaya is Zaya 
as Zaya is. Is she physical? Is she mental? Is she spiritual? Not really a conclusion or right. a conceptualization. Zaya is just Zaya. Yeah. And it is something you perceive in that sense, there is knowing. But, but it's operative knowing. And instead of, uh, you know, it's, it's a different thing. It's, it's not a matter of whether it's your nature's awareness or consciousness or that. That becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. I mean, what you are is in some sense unknowable. Exactly. Not, not determinable. You know, it's beyond consciousness or, or physicality or something like that. You're more mysterious than that. Way more. Yeah. So that's, an, I'm just giving that as an example, that a kind of realization that is being prevented, not because of conditioning, but because of an ignorance that is unconscious, that never got, we never thought of it, we never conceptualized it. You see, we, not, we, we never had to deal with it, we assume like, you know, just like an ordinary person before they experience non-duality, they take being separate as how reality is. They don't question it. That's how it is. Everybody is like that. Everybody is separate. You're separate, <laughs> like your body is separate. And they don't, it doesn't occur to them that it could be something else, you know? So when they experience an underwear, it's like, what happened? That's a complete way of experiencing things. You see, it's, because it's partly their, their conditioning there, but partly it's just, doesn't, it's a different way of looking at things, you see. And the same thing then from non-dual to other realization, and many different teaching have different realizations. You know. mm, at this moment, like many people are confronted to kind of live a little bit on, more on the edge of unknown, like our lives are reshaped by this crisis. And many of us don't know, let's say, how our lives would look like in practically, I would say, not as our true nature, but practically. Um, and also many people have to meet grief, have to meet yes. fear of death. I was just wondering if you have some teachings or that you could offer uh, as a practice for this time where we are confronted with something. Yeah, in some sense it's an opportunity because it's unknown. And the unknown for the ordinary person is a scary place, is uh, you know, untenable place. The unknown, and uh, not knowing, for somebody who's practicing is a good place. It being a possibility of finding something new. Mm -hmm. okay? You don't know. That means you don't know the possibility to find out. See, if you believe you know, that prevents you from finding something new. So that not knowing can be seen as an opportunity, but also for many, for many people will make them uncertain, make them uh, insecure, make them scared. And many people are scared and many people are insecure in this situation normal for most people and that's why uh, for people like that uh, they just need to you do I mean they can either try to make connection to other people I mean they can not necessarily in person but you know you can talk with people online and phone and all that but also to look inward to find out you know is there, is there if you feel you don't know, let yourself accept it as a gift. The not knowing is the is spirit beginning to reveal itself. Because the spirit is not known. <laughs> and ultimately indefinable. So uh, spiritual nature frequently appears at the beginning as not knowing. As unknowing and uncertainty. But and not knowing if you really, if you I really get into the space of not knowing. That knowing is an expression of a, of a specific way that consciousness manifests itself. 
which is stillness and silence. Mm -hmm. And that stillness and silence, the effect on the mind is not knowing. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to know. And for many of us, that's was scary, but it is really, first of all, it, it can take us to stillness, peacefulness, instead of fear, but also a possibility of the arising of something new. And so we can use it, you know, instead of being scared of it. But for many people, it would be difficult for them to use it because they're used to knowing. You know, know what they're going to do next they know what's happening and in reality <laughs> our spiritual teachings say we really don't know what's going to happen <laughs> most people believe they know what's going to happen it's sort of probabilistically mm. knowing really you sort of most likely you think well, you know sun's going to come out <laughs> you know next day and you know in fact in physics it could give you a probability the very high probability the sun will rise next day but they don't know how to present you know not a hundred percent for sure so not knowing for me is in our in my work especially work of inquiry it always begins with not knowing first you see what you think you know and then by inquiring into it you realize you don't know what's what's going on why is it there? What's behind it? And they're not knowing the beginning of the transformation, beginning of the entry into a different realm. So for, for if we are engaged in a spiritual practice, not knowing is good news. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if we're at the beginning of the spiritual path, it can be terrifying. And that's why many of us yeah, yeah. hold on to well, yeah, yeah, because sometimes they're not knowing could take us into emptiness. Silence is a, a sense of emptiness. And for many people, that kind of silence, emptiness is scary because we're used to the chatter in our mind that keeps us company, make us feel that we exist. <laughs> no. And so everything goes quiet. You know, that can be scary. And many people want that peace. But they want a peace. They want most people want peace while the chatter there. You know, they don't want peace to mean no chatter. <laughs> <laughs> it's comforting the chatter. It keeps. Yeah, me... but but real real peace means there's no chatter. It's really quiet. Yeah. You know, inside. And would you say in that quietness, still pure uh, emotions can arise that are yeah. not? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the stillness of consciousness and true quality of the heart can arise. And uh, I, I wouldn't call them emotion. You call them pure emotion. That's a good way of saying it. I will say they're spiritual uh, virtues or spiritual um, qualities like love, compassion, uh, contentment, um, uh, sense of joy, sense of happiness. Like, uh, you know, I've been doing groups with, uh, you know, online Zoom groups, meetings and teaching with some of my groups. And by the end of it, everybody's full of joy and love, you know. And even though everybody is there home, <laughs> you know, there's viruses all around, you and know, because about, of the connection. Yeah. And what about grief? Is there a place for grief that is not entangled with a psychological story necessary? But yeah, there, there is a grief, there's sadness that can happen for, for the suffering of, you know, others. You know, grief usually lo means loss, mm -hmm. is uh, grieving a loss. Now, if I am, uh, if I am my true nature, my spiritual nature, spiritual nature doesn't grieve. It is always complete in itself. So the grief has to do more with the ordinary consciousness, recognizing uh, loss. So it's not wrong, it's not bad, but it is, uh, 
grief means I have lost it. Who's losing? Mm -hmm. If you have no self, there's no loss. Mm -hmm. You see. There's, so you don't experience the grief. You just feel the absence of, you know, of whatever you lost that it is not there. Right. And basically that changes, shifts reality and perception in a different way. And uh, usually, you know, if the other person who I lost was suffering, what arises in me is sorrow for the suffering. You know, there's some sadness, sorrow, kindness. Sadness will bring kindness, but there's sorrow. Sorrow is a real spiritual emotion. Mm, not grief, sorrow. So when, when you experience it, it's like an actor of sort. It's like a love of sort. And it's sorrow because sorrow is nothing like guilt, nothing like uh, remorse, nothing like feeling bad. Sorrow is just a real um, recognition of the suffering of another, a response because you know, sorrow that they suffer. Yeah. So there are things get subtle because there is a spectrum of things. There's all the way from reactive emotions, you know, to true emotion in the moment, in the sense you're sad because something actually really happened now has nothing to do with your conditioning, all the way to just kindness for some suffering happening instead of sadness or sorrow if there, if there is loss yeah. See, but grief is one of those a real thing is not is not because of conditioning it's not normal for the human soul the human being to experience the grief when there's some loss of something we love yeah and many humans i'm bringing also grief because a lot of um a lot of people experience grief um, because of the loss of our planet, you know, because of loss of forest, and this is our home, you know, human home is this planet. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we haven't lost our planets, we lost the way it is, <laughs> the way we like it, you know, that, and that but do, it's we, not we, as ha habitable as usual. That's right, yeah. You know, maybe its beauty is marred some. You know, his beauty is not the same, mm -hmm. not as beautiful. We pollute it, we, you know, exploit it and stuff like yeah. that. And in that sense, there is some kind of loss of, um, actually that, I, I did a teaching on that, you know, in March. And it, it's uh, the part that uh, teaching that has to do with that more than anything else has to do with true conscience. Because Earth is our home, but it's also our mother. Exactly, exactly. You see, we actually, we grew out of it. We, we grow in it, made out of it. It's like a mother, in some sense. And so it loves us and like a mother, take care of us, and we need to feel that love and love love the earth the same way as we love our good mother some people don't love their mother <laughs> i'm talking about the good mother how if your good your mother was good to you you love it because the earth's taking care of us all these years yeah and made it possible for life to exist to evolve until we are here we are <laughs> so yes that brings in the whole thing about climate change and other things and but the virus, of course, interferes with things and makes the earth is not as easy to live in. Yeah. You know, we haven't lost it. It's just uh, it's invaded. <laughs> and you know, throughout human history, we've had many pandemics. So in a way, this is nothing new. Or do you think there is something new here for humanity? We've had. Well, I don't think whether we had pandemics. The plague, the plague lasted for 500 years. Yeah, but then it wasn't the whole earth. 
That's right. It was Europe. It was, it was mostly in Europe and some in Asia. Mm -hmm. But then go, I don't know, it was pandemic for the known world, but there were many parts of the world we didn't go to. So this is the first time in every continent, everywhere. Right. So, I mean, maybe they were called pandemics, they called it pandemic, but this is real global pandemic. Yeah, yeah. It's the first time actually where even uh, Aboriginal people or the Eskimos and uh, they're all experiencing it. And it, was, it doesn't matter where you are, how far you are. You so it's in that sense, it's unifying for the human race. And I'm hoping it is possible that human being will emerge from it with a recognition that we are one family. Right. We are one body. The humanity is one, really. I mean, that's what it, should, it is physically. So now, you know, out of necessity, we are one. You know, we're not, we're not divisible. Yeah. Now, do we learn from that? So that after this passes, we continue recognizing that? We'll, we'll have to see. I think some of it will remain with some people. I don't know how, whether for the whole human race, whether people remember or will just get busy trying to get a job and get married, and, you know, busy with the usual life, which is what makes people away from themselves. They're too busy with external, yeah. as you know. Yeah. Spirituality is usually a luxury. It's a time when you have time, have space to look inward. But also, spirituality can happen at time of adversity, as you know. Some people, their spirituality happened because of the difficulties they were dealing with, you know. It can happen, but, but that's not the usual. I think Most it spirituality mm, happens when we have time and space. Right. But in every spiritual teaching, there is the via negativa, the, the dark night of the soul. There is always a, a crisis that provides opportunity for us to see more of reality. Eventually. Yeah, but you see, the dark night of the soul is an inner process. It doesn't really, you, you could be a billionaire and have dark night of the soul if you're really spiritual. Right, exactly. It's, it's, it's an inner thing. But there are people who experience outer adversity and that led them to a greater realization. There are instances of that. It does happen. In fact, it, the more connected we are, the more that can happen. That we could go to greater freedom. So it is an opportunity, I think, now. But we we must not. Some people think it's oh, it's an opportunity, great. But that that means wonderful. <laughs> it's really trouble for most people. Yeah. You know, for most people, it is just a headache, a suffering, and meditation. Yeah. And we need to recognize that and be and and be sensitive Absolutely. to most of humanity. Just because they're not awakened doesn't mean they're not human. Yeah. No, they're human, just like us, like all of us. And they're all capable of enlightenment. And, and because of that, they all deserve the same caring. Even though they don't, might not understand, might not see it as an opportunity. You know, our heart goes for them. I feel very sad much of the time for what's happening. You know, although I feel happy, whatever, when I'm teaching and all that, but I do, you know. It, it is difficult. It is, it's heart wrenching to see what's happening. Yeah. Well, so I hope you're happy some of the time. I, I am. I am. And it's uh -huh. just, um, I, I've been sharing, and I, they, I feel there is an excitement that I felt right from the beginning, also mm -hmm. when this crisis started, because. It just our normal, the usual is disrupted, and when there is a disruption of our uh, habits, I I see potential for me to experience more. Yeah, um, for me, it's actually great. <laughs> for me, if I was thinking of myself, it's perfect situation. 
because I get to travel around the world without going anywhere. <laughs> without having to get an airplane. I'm teaching people all, you know, rooms everywhere. And also, you know, I like being alone, being, you know, a small place. I don't have to go. I don't really do much outside, so to walk around and, you know, visit friends. I miss friends. I, I usually visit. I don't visit them. But I'm happy being by myself. I'm, I'm just being my feel me which is <laughs> nice you know yeah yeah and yeah. for me for us is giving us also opportunity to kind of reflect really what send is about and you know because when we're organizing live events is one thing after another we're always in this stream of practicalities and deadlines and now actually it's nice to have that disruption and to see other possibilities that. Yeah, well, you have sort of a vacation in some sense. <laughs> and as you said, you have not knowing, which is an opportunity for you. You don't know what, what's the next thing, what to do. Yeah. Yeah. The, for me, I'm, we're, because we're doing things online more than we, we don't usually, we teach in person. Doing online is giving us a new understanding of what's possible. A new ways, a new vent, you know, platform that teaching can happen. I'm not thinking it's going to replace the usual in-person exactly. thing, but it's an additional thing exactly. that has some advantages to it. Because for some people to be online, like you and I talking, it feels like we're really close to each other, exactly. right? Like exactly. you're in my office, sort of. I, I am in your office, right? So for some people like that, because when there's, there's a big group and they're out there and the teacher, they're farther away, they barely can see them. Yeah, but here, everybody who asks you questions right there That's with right. the presenter, with the teacher, right, interacting with them, which is, that's one, you know, thing we, I'm finding out that many people appreciate. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Hamid, for this beautiful conversation and for your time. I want to be cautious not to take more of your time and, uh, and energy. And um, I wish you all the best. And I'm, I'm always happy to do what is best, what is needed. You know, I'm always available when times like this happen or times like if need or I can contribute. Because that's why I'm here. And you've always... Wasn't for that, I won't be here. <laughs> I would have left a long time ago. You're very generous and you always supported yeah. them. And we have a lot of appreciation and gratitude for that. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. And good luck with the whole, you know, conference. You know, I'm sure there are many people who can contribute their wisdom and understanding. And so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you're doing live thing, you're doing recorded things, and yeah. so it's a good idea, I think. We're learning, yeah. No, you're learning to be, to be of service. Not, I mean, you're always being in service, but you're doing it in a different way. That's right. How you're finding the way, how to be useful and yeah. service. And we so. jump and then we start finding the way. That's a little bit our practice that at times is quite challenging you know that this is a little bit the same way you jump and then you find your way <laughs> yeah but you see you had some other because you've already been doing online teaching from before yes. so you already know about how to do it that way so it's a matter of just applying it in a different way that's right you know yeah. and the in-person thing that you do that's a challenge how are you going to do deal with that exactly and what's needed and how we will see that that's the inquiry in the next yeah season. people love it i know they like being together and you know meeting different people all that and here they have to meet them on, online right yeah. yeah different kind of meeting i hope it doesn't become a new normal that's right <laughs> Yes, yeah. Some of these can stay, but I still hope we Some can. of it. I think it's an additional thing. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, good talking to you, Zaya. Yeah, 
nice. And I hope after this we get a chance to share dinner. It's good to see your smiley face. Thank you. And good to see you looking wonderful, like I said at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, well, till next time. Yes, till, I, till next time. Yeah, and I wish everybody well. And I, I will say for everybody, stay safe and be in peace. Mm. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Hyde. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.